Today's topic is sebaceous cysts and what to do about them. Welcome back. This is Dr. Marie Azizian, board certified general surgeon and certified functional medicine provider. So today, everything is about sebaceous cysts. Sometimes they are called skin cysts. So we will be talking about why do they occur, so their etiology, where, which locations on the body are the most prevalent, how often, what is your chance of getting a sebaceous cyst in your lifetime. Also, we will discuss why they get infected and what to do with them, whether they're infected or not infected. So let's get started. And before we get going, so please like, subscribe, share. Thank you very much. Let's get going. So first things first. So what are sebaceous cysts? Sebaceous cysts originate from sebaceous glands. Those are little glands that are associated with our hairs. So usually you would see and find sebaceous cysts in the areas where there is hair. And that is one of the reasons why you would not find sebaceous cysts on palms of your hands and soles of your feet. There are some other cysts that live there, but not sebaceous cysts. Sebaceous cysts produce this oil that is called sebum. And the role of the sebum is to protect and lubricate our skin and hair follicle. So why do sebaceous cysts actually happen from the sebaceous gland? So what actually happens is that the gland becomes blocked. When it becomes blocked, then the sebaceous uh, gland in association with hair follicles starts growing and growing and sebum, that oil, starts accumulating. So at the end, we end up with a bump. And talking about sebaceous cysts, as a, a, a practicing surgeon, I see all kinds of and all types of sebaceous cysts. Some of them are very small, they're barely visible and barely palpable, and some of them could be quite large, several inches. So that's how they happen. And who is more prone to get these sebaceous cysts? Of course, adults are more prone than children, and they do start to be more pronounced or they become visible in puberty when those glands become more active. So we see it more in adults than in children. And also there's a little bit of a predilection of higher incidence of these cysts in men uh, versus women. But honestly, we see it in a clinical practice. It almost feels like 50-50. What are the locations of these cysts? The locations are Face. It could be anywhere on the face. Also, the areas of interest are behind ears. A side note that you can have cysts on the scalp, and those cysts are called pilar cysts. Pilar cysts are similar to sebaceous cysts, but they're slightly different morphologically, and do, they do appear when they're being dissected out. They also appear to be a little bit different. I call them little beautiful pearls, but they are similar, and they're basically a subfamily of sebaceous cysts because they have have the same etiology. They are just slightly different and have a special name, but essentially the same thing. So moving on to locations. One of the most common location is our trunk. So trunk, the front, chest, even abdomen, although more on the chest than on the abdomen. On the abdomen, you are more prone to lipomas. Maybe we'll discuss them later in another video. But Cysts are more common on the chest and they're also common, very common on the back. So probably I could say, and statistically that supports that, the back is the most common area for sebaceous cysts. A little side note again, that frequently people discover these cysts after they lose weight. Why does it happen? It could be that uh, there has been a cyst there all along and it was small and barely palpable. Once you lose weight, it becomes more pronounced and you feel like it just came on, but it may have been there all along. So location essentially anywhere on the body, as I mentioned earlier, except for palms and soles of the feet, and also areas that are active, that are oily. So sometimes you will see these in behind the ears. Of course, there is a separate mention for cysts located in the underarm and also located in the groin area. And there is a condition that is along the same lines. When you have lots of cysts and they are always inflamed or getting infected, 
and this condition is called hydrodenitis and usually what we see in a surgical clinic is hydrogen superativa so that's a very very unpleasant condition for the patient because they're basically going from one infection to the other very frequently so what are the chances of you having a cyst any of us actually could develop at least one cyst in a life in our lifetime that's very common and that happens a lot and many people of course develop more than one cyst and some people genetically are more prone to multiple cysts both on the scalp and throughout their body so that happens what is the incidence of infection and why does it happen infection happens from variety of reasons as you know we do have bacteria that always is present on our skin it's called staph aureus and people just call it staph but it's staph aureus bacteria and that bacteria is part of our skin flora however however if something goes wrong if it starts overgrowing or if we become colonized with MRSA which is a methicillin resistant staph aureus in that case our cysts are more likely to get infected but usually the reasons the cysts get infected there are several reasons for that and the reasons are friction one of the biggest reason is friction so if somebody is something is rubbing on your cyst all the time then it's irritating it or another situation which I always speak against and try not to make it happen is family members squeezing those cysts please don't do that so and that's then patient call us and then we see an infected cyst so uh, what do we do about infection there are two ways to go about it the first scenario or rather two scenarios the first scenario if this infection is an abscess it's a big red angry looking volcano as i call it in that situation drainage is the answer so we do have to surgically drain it and also place this patient on antibiotic in some cases antibiotic could be omitted in young and healthy patients because drainage is the definitive way to address it however in a situation where you come in and the cyst is a little infected but not a lot and it's not it hasn't come to a head so to speak in that situation we do not need to drain it actually in that situation I would prefer to place this patient on antibiotic and um, spare them drainage because drainage of the cyst is quite an unpleasant procedure uh, why is it unpleasant procedure because the um, anesthetic the numbing medication does not work that well on the infected tissues so that's why it's an unpleasant procedure for the patient so we always try to spare the patient from having this unpleasant procedure and how do we electively remove the cysts we often see patients in our clinic who come in with questions should I have my cyst removed and my answer is essentially the same if the cyst has not changed if it looks like a classic cyst it has no it's not concerning for cancer or any other masses then there is no need for an excision if it doesn't bother this patient and if they've had it for a long time let's say they've had it for five six seven ten twenty years and it has not changed then of course it could be removed but it's not really necessary to remove it meaning that medically it's not a concerning cyst but it could be removed the patient says well I just don't like it yes of course it could be removed if the cyst is very new let's say somebody comes in with the mass and they say well I just noticed it let's say three months ago three months is very new and it bothers me etc then first of all it needs to be evaluated to make sure that there are no cancerous features to it and usually clinical exam is sufficient for that uh, you don't really need to order any study for an obvious uh, cyst however if there's any concern for a new mass especially let's say in the neck area I almost always get an ultrasound uh, just to make sure that there is nothing else that we call a cyst so in the situation of a new cyst or in the situation of a bothersome cyst of course it should be uh, removed the way we remove it it removal as I always say to our patients removal is not a drainage removal entails removing the whole sac so it's an incision that is usually the diameter of the cyst we remove and dissect the whole cyst 
out and then I close it with sutures uh, and then we remove the sutures in about 10 days or so. So this is a sebaceous cyst in a nutshell. Thank you so much for listening and until next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.